Well, thanks very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to come and talk about uh, what I think is a very important topic. As many of you know, um, we put on, that, that is USDA puts on an Outlook um, conference as well every year. We, I think we just com concluded our 89th uh, conference just two weeks ago. And I think you'll see in my presentation that many of the um, projections that, that we, we think, you know, what the world looks like over the next 10 years or so mirror very well what a -Bear has put out or what you saw yesterday. I've been asked to uh, discuss the market opportunities in Asia. And while I'm less willing to concede the century to Asia, uh, there's no question that Asia is, a major, is going to be a major driver in um, world markets over the next few um, many years. Uh, just for the U.S., for the past two years, China has been our number one export destination. That is, and only five years ago, I think they were number five. Uh, since 2005, U.S. ag exports to China uh, rose by about 20 percent per year. We, uh, China, as many of you know, uh, imports about uh, 60 percent of the world trade in soybeans. Of, of, about 40 percent of the world trade in cotton, uh, 20 percent of the world trade in veg, uh, soybean oil, um, just uh, very, very large markets. And I, for the U.S., 75 percent of our exports um, going to China are cotton and soybeans, really dominated of the two there by soybeans. But uh, what we've seen over the last five years is growth in a whole variety of commodities from uh, feed grains to uh, 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 other uh, other fruits and vegetables and other sorts of uh, products. So a lot of, lot of stuff going on. Uh, today what I'm going to do is kind of review a lot of the trends, and, and I think uh, it's oftentimes the problem of going uh, uh, on the second day that you'll have seen some of these charts before. But um, I want to, uh, again, I, again, sharing much of the um, same views that I think that, that some of the previous speakers had. Uh, but I'm going to focus probably on three or four commodities. I'm going to look at wheat, look at dairy, look at beef in particular. I, I do want to talk, touch on soybeans. But uh, I'll wrap up with just a discussion of some of uh, what I consider some of the major trade issues that we see. Well, let's go to some of the major drivers. And I think this, this chart at least was shown twice yesterday, at least in the sessions I was in. And that's just the UN projections on population, where the 9.3 billion uh, people by 2050, um, where those numbers come from. And you can see a large portion of that is Asia. I think the growth over the next, uh, uh, or over the next 35, 40 years uh, in Asia is, is somewhere along the lines of 1 billion people. So we know that population is growing. We know that a large portion of that, at least over the next uh, 40, 50 years, are, are going to be in Asia. You can see from the chart that Africa, over time, um, really becomes a big driver as well. But, but certainly you know, over the next 20, 30, 40 years, I think uh, um, really looking at population growth in Asia. The other big thing, of course, is economic growth. And I think this chart, too, was shown yesterday. I think Vim had it up on, on, on the screen. Uh, we know China and India, and more recently, India have been running double-digit growth rates. Um, but the region as a whole, again, very, very strong growth. And you look at that compared to the developed countries. You look at that compared to some of the other regions, even, um, w with other developing countries. The, the developing country growth rates in, in Asia have just been staggering and are expected to continue, although uh, we, too, would, would see growth uh, in China um, moderating a little bit. Uh, below those t double digit uh, figures that, that we've seen over the last 10 or so years. Um, uh, Ramesh had a great, in, in his presentation, talked a lot about India. Um, and he also mentioned that the fact that, unlike a lot of the other countries, that their uh, per capita consumption of animal products has not, uh, in dairy and other sorts of things, has not, they, they haven't seen big shifts in diets. But, for a lot of other countries in Asia, you have seen very um, uh, big shifts. And uh, you can see this just plotting uh, uh, sort of, uh, in this case, looking at urbanization and what the impacts uh, on uh, meat consumption are animal products in, in general. Um, and, and a very important driver there. 
The other thing, of course, is, is income itself. And with income, with middle class diets, in a lot of these countries, you have seen a move towards uh, meat, dairy, and poultry. Um, a, a similar chart to what Ramesh uh, just showed, only for a more aggregate uh, uh, figure here, uh, you can see sort of the changing composition of diets over time. And again, these things have their ups and downs, and a lot are going to depend on what economic growth is in those countries or uh, you know, incidents of poverty in a particular period. But there's a general trend, again, moving away from grains, moving more towards meat, dairy, poultry. Also, uh, and this uh, was, was certainly, uh, you see this as well in India, uh, is, is uh, the importance of fruits and vegetables in, in diets. Um, what's interesting to me is sort of this overall decline in uh, the percent of calories in general from cereals. Uh, where we're seeing more and more in, in animals. And we'll, we'll see that it has important implications both for trade in animal products, but also for the feedstocks that go into uh, uh, animal production, um, particularly uh, corn and soybeans. Okay, well, let me, let me switch over to a little talk about wheat. Here, uh, again, some uh, real big shift in trade um, in imports in general um, for wheat uh, over the last five years. And I think that, that our projections certainly looking out over the next uh, 10 years or so, we're, we expect those to increase further. Um, I think that, that um, if we look at individual countries, this is our own baseline, our 10-year projections. Uh, we do see, I mean, a country like China being a very, uh, world's largest wheat producer, um, India being the second largest wheat producer in, in the world. Um, China, we do expect them to become an, uh, or to increase wheat export, or imports rather. Uh, I, I think there though, what, what you're more likely to see is, I mean, remember that these, these projections always have nice smooth lines, but in reality, they vary a lot uh, according to yields and, and um, you know, uh, how uh, particular uh, climate occurrences in any given year. And so I would expect, because of that, China to be big in, in, in any particular year, uh, again, with, with a poor crop or whatever, they could come into the market very heavily. Um, but again, countries like Indonesia, Bangladesh, we're seeing, uh, at least the USDA forecasts that they will become increasingly larger importers of wheat. And on the export side, I think that, that uh, and Ramesh me mentioned this as well, India, which has been a very large exporter over time, I think does move more towards self-sufficiency. Uh, we would agree with that assessment uh, over the next few years. Um, I, an interesting thing about uh, the uh, wheat imports and, and wheat consumption in general in Asia uh, is we have seen a uh, larger per, uh, per percent over the last few years of wheat being consumed as feed. Now, there's really no mystery to this. A lot of it is due to the fact that over the last couple of years, of course, that we, we've had um, uh, large shortfalls in the U.S. corn crop and, and a drop in corn exports uh, to the region. So a lot of countries, and I, I'm thinking here specifically of, say, South Korea and, and others, that would normally import feed grains are now importing our wheat and, and using uh, our feeding wheat. And then the other thing, obviously, with, with wheat quality pro problems that we've seen, I, Australia had problems a, a couple of years back. Uh, we've had problems, uh, and with that, when with lower quality wheat certainly ending up on the market, they, they are going to mainly go into feed markets. Uh, frankly, with the shortage of, of corn, due to the drought this last year, and even the year before we had uh, uh, some uh, shortfalls, the good news is that there has been a lot of feed quality wheat, I think, uh, uh, out in the world market. Well, this too was mentioned, I think Paul had mentioned this in his presentation yesterday, the emergence of the Black Sea, and, and I, I went back a few more years, I think, than what was presented last, uh, yesterday, and you'll, you know, to, to demonstrate the point that the Black Sea actually we're, we're net importers uh, not too uh, long ago, and we really have seen a big, big shift where they are uh, now accounting for about 20% of the world uh, wheat exports. Um, and in our projections, uh, we're looking at them over the next 10 years, perhaps taking as much as 25% of the uh, market, uh, world market. Very large, there's a lot of productivity, uh, potential productivity gains uh, there. 
um, also some, some available lands that could come in here. The one thing I would point out, though, and you can see this by the chart, is the variation that uh, not, we know just last 2010, 2011, uh, the, the problems that, that we saw in the drought uh, in the Black Sea again this year uh, affected by poor yields. And if you look at just the yield, look at yield variability, and here this is, and I apologize for the wonkish uh, terminology here, but wh what I tried to do is I, I just looked at yield trends over time, and I sort of detrended the yields. So I tried to take out the, the sort of average movements upward as, as we've seen productivity gains and look at the, the variation that's left over. And not surprising, Australia, I mean, you know more than anyone how variable the climate is and the fact that, that it's highly variable yields. If you look at the other extreme, you know, uh, northern Europe, where the weather, uh, you know, uh, the yield variation uh, from year to year is actually very small. Uh, U.S., uh, really, you'd have to go in the U.S. Uh, in the aggregate, it's pretty small. It depends on really what region of the U.S. you're in. But the interesting thing to me is looking at the Black Sea, and the Black Sea tells a story that it, it too, is highly variable. And again, here what I did is I plotted market share and then our projected, using our uh, forecasts, um, out of our baseline, looked at projected market share over time. And you can see that I said 25%, and I just clearly wasn't painted in my notes, almost 30% um, how important the Black Sea is going to be. I think what this means is with additional vari the variation, this is going to be a, a, a highly variable a market to continue. And we've seen that, excuse me, over the last uh, four or five years, uh, but with, you know, again, growth in demand and um, uh, uh, the, the good news is Black Sea will be a, a very important supplier, but again, because of the yield variability that we see there, that uh, it will um, be a highly variable one. Well, let me uh, move quickly, and I, and I won't spend much time on this because I know, uh, apart from canola, there's not a lot of oil seeds grown here, um, but this really has been a huge market, and the story for China has essentially been the commercialization of their poultry operations, commercialization of their pork op operations. So you're getting out of sort of these backyard operations into more confinement, um, uh, uh, large-scale operations that where the animals are being fed uh, processed feeds. A lot of the soybean demand for soybean meal has gone up, and China has found that it's just not competitive, that it's far more competitive producing corn um, and, and other grains. And so area uh, in four soybeans has been flat or even declining, as we saw over this last year. And they've been meeting soybean demand by imports. And that's, those are imports, obviously, from the U.S. and, and, and um, uh, South America in particular. Uh, but that's, uh, those are, if you look at, look at consumption, which I'm not showing here, but obviously you can add the two, uh, that it's, it's been a growth rate that's been on the order of 14% per year for the last 10, 15 years. I mean, just remarkable. Um, if I didn't extend this out showing the baseline, but our, our baseline, but we in, anticipate China to remain a very large importer of, of soybeans. And again, this is driving the, um, uh, what's driving it is this increased animal production. And uh, with, with that, we now are beginning to see where China is now in the market for, um, uh, admittedly, in a fairly small way, compared certainly compared to soybeans, but um, now also is importing some caloric uh, input as well. So we, we've seen corn imp uh, imports, for example, start to uh, increase some. And we, we anticipate as we're moving out over the next 10 years for corn imports as well to increase. Um, let me, let me switch over to the meat side, and I just mentioned the uh, importance here. China is, be again, because of urbanization, because of, of uh, rapid income growth and, and an emerging, uh, large emerging middle class in China, you are seeing a lot more meat being consumed. They are getting their meat both in, in the way of imports, and you can see here uh, particularly pork and, 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 and uh, uh, poultry imports. but. Um, also, as I mentioned, increased um, uh, uh, animal production. 
Ramesh also mentioned <clears throat> the very important phenomena, uh, and I think it was mentioned yesterday in, in um, I, I can't remember by Paul or, or, or who brought this out, um, about the importance of India in the in world beef markets. Here you see the, the rapid growth in production uh, over the last few years and, and uh, the percent that is being exported to the world. And I think um, our next chart looks very, very similar to what was shown uh, yesterday. You can see that, that uh, Brazil, of course, has been a very large exporter. Um, it's anticipated to, to increase exports, but the real star here is India. And um, I, I found Ramesh's comments about the, the longer-term sustainability of this growth a very interesting one. Ours only goes out to 2022 or so. Um, but again, the, uh, at least in the short run, we're, we're anticipating some fairly uh, uh, large growth in terms of beef exports from um, uh, India. And that is, again, you can see where Australia and the U.S. Is, are in, the, in this market. We've, of course, been important exporters to the, to the world. Um, uh, the U.S., you see the drop that occurred, after, uh, particularly uh, after uh, the discovery of BSE. We have started to regain those markets. We're, um, of, uh, I think, this last year above pre-BSE levels, finally. But with, with fairly limited growth, um, uh, certainly compared to these others. And again, that, that would be true uh, for what we're seeing for Aus Australia as well. Um, let me switch over to dairy, and there too, just massive import growth, um, uh, you know, and, and projected uh, th that we've seen over the last few years, uh, largely in the form of cheese and, and uh, uh, nonfat dry milk and um, uh, dry whole milk uh, powder. If you look at milk, uh, China, of course, uh, you had the a problem with melamine, but in, which accounts a bit for the, 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 the drop that we saw. But again, regaining that, I think if uh, most of uh, the analyses that I've seen projecting out show very similar growth rates that we've seen both in terms of uh, fluid consumption and also um, uh, for manufacturing purposes. Here I'm, I'm just showing the, the, what we've seen, at least in world markets, in terms of dairy imports, both in, on, on the powder side, but even on the fluid milk side in China. And looking out uh, briefly, just looking at, at um, uh, the, their supply, you can see a larger share is coming from, from imports. And um, certainly for, for particularly for non, uh, dry nonfat milk powder, that the, the scale, you, be careful as you're looking at the scale. Uh, to, uh, of course, whole milk powder is, is far more important, at least in terms of overall volumes. But growth rates, again, uh, we've seen some some very large, uh, significant growth there. And then the other only uh, the, the other market I'd like to briefly touch on is Indonesia, and there too we've seen very very similar movements in terms of of um, uh, increased imports. Uh, again, I think this is it mir mirrors quite well to the the basic story that that. Um, I've been trying to tell this morning that is increased income, increased population, uh, really has been driving a lot of this shift in diets and other sorts of things towards uh, uh, protein in the form of animal products. Okay, let me f just wrap up briefly talking about some issues, and these obviously transcend uh, Asia per se, um, and, and, and some may be more generic to, to or specific, say, to the U.S., like, like our farm bill. But one has been the volatility that we've seen in the markets, and and there I think, um, you know, uh, the 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 work that was done that I think that Sammy presented yesterday on on looking at at uh, projections to the year 2050. That of course everyone is keyed on that, or uh, or there are a lot of people actually keyed on that these days in terms of how we're going to go about feed feeding the world, and I think that, that uh, I, I appreciated uh, David Hallam's comments and Ken Ash's comments yesterday talking about um, uh, just, you know, uh, trying to meet that in terms of, of closing yield gaps and the, those sorts of things. Uh, we there's a lot of work in the G20 done just on things like market transparency and, and information. Australia has been a very uh, keen player. Uh, Abares has been a very keen player in that. Um, uh, as, as well as a number of other countries, uh, such as India, and um, uh, you know, and I, I think this is one thing that we can hopefully improve. That is, 
through fora like this, frankly, in terms of improving market information to help countries make more informed decisions so we don't see the sort of disruptive uh, uh, policies that, that can occur and, and, in, and increase rather than reduce price volatility. Um, uh, TPP obviously is a very um, uh, uh, topical uh, issue these days. Uh, I think the, the, the recent uh, joining by Canada and, and now it looks Japan, that this will be a very positive if done, I think, in a comprehensive way and that we can get some uh, uh, substantial reforms and see some significant market access. I think that would, uh, uh, the other side of this that, that wasn't really talked about much yesterday, um, I, I guess Ken Ash talked, uh, uh, touched on it briefly, but are all the trade issues and, and uh, constraints that way that prevent f uh, a free flow of goods, um, uh, which, which obviously help if when you're talking in the long run about meeting these food availability issues and uh, uh, one thing that, that clearly you're not going to see productivity grow equally in all places and that's going to mean a, a, a bigger role for trade and so I think things like TPP and, and here I would say uh, DOA certainly as well um, would be very big things. And let me last just conclude with uh, a couple of other minor issues and those are uh, what the policy um, debates that are now going on uh, both in the EU in terms of uh, their uh, uh, more recent things in terms of, of cap reform and uh, the, the situation in the U.S. which is uh, on, on the farm bill is, as many of you know the thought had been that there would be a, a passage of a farm bill last year that's been put off debate until this year uh, m much of the debate now is tied up directly with this, uh, these budget negotiations that are going on. And, and the question is, in terms of meeting a lot of the, uh, uh, these fiscal targets that Congress is trying to grapple with right now, if a lot of the, uh, the, the presumption is, is that a lot of savings will come from agriculture. And so I think that we're likely to see some fairly major changes uh, in programs. And programs like direct payments, which have been around um, since the mid-1990s likely will be eliminated, um, uh, I think, either through a budget, the budget action or a farm bill. With that, let me conclude and uh, look forward to questions afterwards.